Good Vach, Shavua Tov. Thank you, Rabbi Walker, for your uh, eloquent introduction. Um, when Chao Enlai became Prime Minister of China in 1971, that was after Mao Zedong died. So, uh, as you all know, President Nixon went to China and for the first time in probably hundreds if not thousands of years, the Western world was exposed to uh, China. And that opened up a whole series of negotiations. But one, one anecdote that took place that really, I think, captures something critical is uh, the Western journalists interviewed Chao Enlai, the Chinese Prime Minister, and they asked him, they had the opportunity to ask him, they said to him, so what does he think? What does China think about the American Revolution? I think many of you will like this answer in the UK. What do you think about the American Revolution? And his classic answer was, it's too early to tell, okay? It's too early to tell because the American Revolution just happened 300 years ago and the Chinese civilization is almost 1,500 years old. You know, we Jews have been around even more than that, double that time. You know, Abraham goes back approximately 3,800 years. And I hear from people who do business with China that uh, they don't like anyone except Jews. Not because they're particularly Jewish lovers, but they respect longevity. They respect something that's been around for so many thousands of years. You know, we ourselves as Jews don't always appreciate it. But especially when a world is in upheaval, like what we're experiencing now, and everyone across the board, leaders, lay people, financiers, everybody has no clue what's going on. And in the most tragic way, so as long maybe it was isolated, to terrorist attacks and knifings in Israel, in some way the world says, okay, Israel, you know. But once it starts hitting the mainland, New York on September 11th, mainland USA, and then now here in Europe, in France, and al tiftach peh, God should protect every innocent citizen in the world, and our hearts and prayers go out, especially to our brothers and sisters in Israel, where every day literally you hear new news just before I got up here, I asked the rabbi, what's happening? Just wanted to hear. And of course, there's another attack, Kiryat Gat, Tel Aviv. So when we're in such a situation, you hear every conversation ends, what's going on? What's happening? How do you make sense of this? It's probably unprecedented. And I can share with you, I remember vividly, September 11th, that Tuesday morning, so I came to work, I live in Crown Heights, I have an office there, so I came to my office. It was nine o'clock in the morning, and someone tells me, go up to the roof, something happened. So I was in Brooklyn, so I go up to the roof, and I see the two smoking twin towers. They were, had both been struck already at that point. And it was like completely surreal. You know, I called my father immediately. My father was a journalist. I say was because he's passed away, and I don't think they're journalists up in heaven. Um, they don't need journalists, you know. So uh, my father, I called him, I couldn't get through because the cell phones were all so busy. But finally I get through. My father had no clue that anything happened. And I said, you know, Top, did you hear about the smoke? No. But immediately, without hesitating, and he seemed to know things more than anybody because he had that pulse, his hand on the pulse. I said to him, he said to me, Arab terrorists, Muslim terrorists. But then they chased us off the roof. So I went down to my office, turned on the, the monitor to see what's happening. You know, New York was in disarray because no one knew what was coming, what was going. You saw the march of people walking across the bridges and no one knew what other attacks would be coming. And I don't know if instinctively, like a knee-jerk reaction, I opened up a chumash, a Torah, a Bible, and I just turned to a verse. The verse is in the, in the chapter right in the beginning of Genesis, Lech Lecha, the third chapter. And there was one verse that captures something that uh, the, 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 the mood, the environment, in ways I don't think anybody can capture as well as that biblical statement. Yishmael, it's talking about Yishmael. Who is Yishmael? Son of Abraham. And it says, Pera Adam, 
Yodhi Bakel v'yad kol boy. He's a wild man. He will be a wild man. His hand will be in everything and everything will be opposing uh, uh, him. And I said, no better way to capture this insanity. Till this day, it's 14 years since 9-11. 15 years. Till this day, no one has a clue. What did they want? You know, every attack in history, every war, every battle, you at least know what your enemy wants. You know how to surrender if you want to surrender. Even the most obscene Hitler and the Nazis, we knew exactly what they wanted. Aryan sup supremacy, Lebanon's room, they want land, they want the reason, they want to control the world for their supreme dream. Jews obviously need to be eliminated and everyone else would be subjugated to them. So you know your enemy, you know what they want, as crazy as it is. Here, what do they want? Was this like the beginning of an assault on the United States? You know, like a front line? It wasn't. Until this day, people can't answer the question. What do they want when they uh, went into the cafes and the theaters and the stadium last week in Paris? What exactly do they want? You know, tell us what you want, we can decide. We'll negotiate, we'll agree, we disagree. So these things leave us very baffled because besides the tragedy and the carnage of the deaths and the losses and so on, when you don't even know what's going on, where is it going to come from next? It creates tremendous, um, a tremendous demoralization and disorientation that I think leaders as well as civil citizens anywhere in the Western world and probably the Eastern world as well are all struggling to understand. Now we all see that there are no real leaders because everybody's at best trying to put out the fires you know, band-aid solutions. So I want to share with you, beyond of obviously the need to go into military intervention just like you do anything to protect innocent people, but I want to share with you, I believe, that if we go back, like Chow and Lai said, it's too early to tell. Modern world simply does not have the tools and the knowledge and information to how to look at and understand the events going on in the world today. It's as clear as day. The question is, can we figure it out? And I want to propose here that we Jews have a tremendous role to play today because we are people, both of the modern age, but also people of the past. We've gone through holocausts. We've seen every abyss possible, and we're still here. And we have an unbroken chain of wisdom and experience that can tremendously help understand and collect clarity with what is happening. And you know, you can't fight a war without clarity. Intelligence is critical. You know, there's the element of a war, the actual military side, but intelligence, understanding, know thy enemy, know what they want, understand what's going on. And that's what I'd like to focus on. And I believe when you start looking into the texts, you find, I mean, I would say unbelievable insights, and you can even say uh, uh, predictions of what would evolve and how we understand the world today based on the past. And there's no other way to understand what's happening unless we go into those texts. Now, I'll tell you honestly where I come from after September 11th, I did exactly that. I researched it. I wanted to understand what is going on in the minds of those young Muslims that would give them the motivation, the passion, to ready to die and fly a plane into a skyscraper. I mean, that takes a certain type of uh, mentality. Now, the West, a lot of people like to dismiss it that these people were just criminals, uh, malcontents, social misfits. They're not at all that way. If you look at their histories, there are many of them very educated in Western schools, in Western universities, and they've got a whole philosophy. This isn't just a few people who are like, like frustrated and like, you know, going on a serial uh, killing. Planned, strategized for years. Bin Laden himself, and many of it was, it was, came from an elitist and an aristocratic family from Saudi Arabia. He was not poor. He was not mistreated. So when you start realizing that, you look into what's going on in their minds. What, what did they read? What texts are they reading? And where are they coming from? And frankly, I just want to make sure to make point out, I'm not here to justify or explain them. I'm here to understand. <clears throat> and when you look at what they are involved in and what philosophies they follow and ideologies, you suddenly realize all this comes back to a man called Abraham exactly 3,800 years ago, the man that pioneered faith in the first place. All religion began then. A man who 
rebelled against the status quo of his pagan society and embraced a God and embraced a world that instead of us being takers, we're supposed to be givers. Last says Dukkah and Mishpat. That's what he taught his family. And that's the birth of monotheism and all the major religions. Today, uh, 2.5 billion Christians, 1.8 million Muslims, billion, billion I should say, over 4 billion people on this planet that trace their lineage and their ideas directly to Abraham. And of course the Jews were just 14 million, but we were always the carriers of the flame. And everything originated, obviously, with the Torah and Judaism. So it's critical to go into and trace the steps. And when you do so, you'll be amazed to see literally a pattern emerges. A pattern, a picture. I, I was quite amazed when I started seeing it, but you have to look at the text, and I'll go over some of them right now. You know, they tell the story, the joke, um, a guy gets up in the Knesset and says, you know, I have a solution to all our problems. Instead of fighting with the Arabs and the Muslims, let's attack the United States. And of course, uh, they'll beat us. And then, out of guilt, they'll rebuild us like they did Japan and Germany after World War II. And we'll get a lot more money this way. This is like a whole plan. Some Jewish chacham came up with this idea. So an old Jew in the back of the room gets up and says, very nice idea, but one problem. What happens if we win? You know? So Jews are great at playing defense. I don't think anyone can play defense like we can. We've survived everything. Thank God. Every challenge. So when we're faced with crisis, which means when there's an enemy, anti-Semitism, racism, Nazism, whatever, communism, all the isms, we learn to not just survive, but to thrive. The greatest way to, to raise money for charity is to say we're under threat. In 1948, even though Jews usually disagree about everything, and there were some disagreements, but most of the Jews could agree on the fact that we need a homeland, especially after the Holocaust. But many young people ask today, okay, now that we've already united and we've found a homeland and we have an army and we have power, now what do you do with success? What's our vision for the next 50 years? And frankly, many Jews, we've, we've been on so much on defense for so many years, we've forgotten how to plan for the future. We're excellent at saying we're anti-anti-Semites. You know how many organizations uh, are anti-anti-Semites? But if someone says to you, what do you stand for? Not everyone could answer that that easily. And that's also part of this discussion. Because it's not just about how to understand the enemy, how to protect ourselves, how to uh, respond to them. It's also, do we have a vision for the future or don't we? Because frankly, as crazy as this sounds, a passionate radical, a passionate mushugana, is always going to be more powerful than a passive, brilliant rationalist. Because passion trumps everything. And it's sad to see, tragic to see, that the most passionate people on earth today are terrorists. And if you don't counter that with equal passion for the good, frankly, I don't think we can beat them. It's impossible to fight passion with, with passivity or with mediocrity. And that's very much part of this discussion. So let's get into some of the texts and some of the background. Some of what I'm going to share with you, I actually um, covered when studying a Barbanel. Don Isaac Barbanel was a great giant, commentator, leader. He was there at the Spanish expulsion. And he wrote in many of his commentaries about events going on in the world. And interestingly, obviously a very different world, but there was also the confrontations because Spain was controlled either by the Catholics and the Christians or by the Moors and the Muslims. It was a very central part of the battles. So he writes about the battles between those two different entities. And of course, the Jews are always in the middle of everything. So some of what I'm sharing is coming from his commentaries on Daniel, on the book of Daniel and some other of the, of the books of Tanakh. But here's the story. Let's go back and trace it back. Let's start from the beginning. So I mentioned Abraham initiated, pioneered a new path, a path that went against the, 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 the conformity of his times, which was essentially a pagan world, dog eats dog, survival of the fittest, if you wish. 
And Abraham taught a new approach, which actually offended everybody. And that was that we have to answer to a God, not God answers to us. We don't make idols. We don't create a God in our image. God created us in God's image. And therefore, we're accountable to a higher calling. And that calling is to not be a greedy narcissist, but to be a giving, charitable virtue. And that's the purpose of our lives. And of course, he didn't just commit to it. He taught this to his children. Who was his first child? Yishmael. Yishmael was his first child. His second child would be Isaac, that he would have with Sarah. Now, you read the Bible, you don't need to do any commentaries. They're already at war, right? In their childhood. Sarah insists that Yishmael be sent away. Now, we're not very clear when you read the Bible, what exactly did Yishmael do that, uh, that Sarah felt was a threat? But clearly something was happening. Then you read the next generation, uh, Isaac, has his own family. And he again has two children, Esau and Jacob. This time they're twins. And again they're at battle. They're at battle even in the womb of their mother, Rebecca. They're at war. And the Torah says it again specifically. No commentary needed. You have two nations inside of you. When Rebecca complained, I wanted to understand why is she having such a difficult pregnancy? God responds, you have two nations that you carry within you and they will be perpetually at odds with each other. When one rises, the other one will fall. The two nations. So in this home or tent of Abraham and then in that of Isaac, you already have the seeds of discord and conflict planted. And as I said, understand that conflict and you'll understand the conflict today. That's how... That's how um, consistent it is. So what is the conflict exactly? What was going on there? But before we get to that, let me just give you a few more dots in history, which I'll return to, and just you see the trajectory, as I said, connecting the dots, and the pattern will be ob as obvious without any forcing it, as obvious at the, like, as, as we're sitting right here. So what happens next? So the story continues in the Bible that Jacob then builds his family, he deals with Esau, which we'll get back to. And he builds his 12 tribes. We actually read, that, read that about that today. And he continues the journey. The Bible basically concludes about Esau and Yishmael telling us their genealogy, their family tree, which of course makes us wonder why. Why do we need to know who all of their children and grandchildren when we're not going to hear about them anymore in the Bible? But you'll see in a moment we will. And the same thing with Esau. Esau and Yishmael, brothers, uh, one brother of Isaac and another a brother of, of Jacob, children of the great Abraham and Isaac, we hear about their family trees. And then the Torah goes off to Jacob's side. We don't hear about uh, the others as, uh, further. What happens is Jacob's children go down to Egypt. I'm just summing it up quickly. 210 years they spend in a bitter exile. They get out of Egypt, the book of Exodus. They march toward uh, Mount Sinai. They afterwards build their Mishkan sanctuary and the rest of the Torah is the 40 years of their journey through the wilderness until they get to the border, the eastern side of the river Jordan and they're ready to march into Israel. That's how the Torah ends. And then it continues the story in Joshua, the whole stories of the kings and the leaders all the way till the end of the age of the prophets. Okay, so what is the next so-called dot in history we're going to cover here? Let's talk about Sinai. Suddenly we hear in the Talmud an interesting thing, a reappearance made by the children of Yishmael and the children of Esau. What happens? The Talmud tells us, and the Medrash elaborates in different places, that before God gave the Torah to the Jews, he turned to the children of Yishmael and the children of Esau, each separately, and said, would you like to receive this Torah? And one of the, they all said the right thing. You, let's see what it says inside. I'm not signing a contract that I didn't read. They look inside, not, it's not for me. This one didn't like the law of Leisitzach, do not murder. This one didn't like the law of Leisinov, do not have sexually inappropriate relations. This is not a contract we can accept. So then God turns to the Jewish people, and the Jewish people say, Nasa v'nishma, we accept, and then we will understand. And they receive the Torah. It's a very weird and strange episode. What would happen if the Yishmael, the children of Yishmael, and the children of Esau actually had said yes? What would happen? What would God say to the Jews? You just suffered 210 years. I promised you the land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And hey, by the way, I gave it away to the Ishmael and Esau. 
And so what God was playing games, he knew they wouldn't accept it, so why is he offering it to them? So the Zohar, the classic mystical text, answers a brilliant, simple answer. He says he offered it to them because he wanted them and knew that one day they will accept it. Not today. So you begin by so-called presenting them the ideas. He knew they would say no. But what would happen a thousand years later? So a Jewish man, who we don't um, obviously abide by, suddenly, and his apostles, brought the teachings of Judaism in their own distorted and bastardized and uh, whatever diluted fashion. They brought it to the pagans of where? Of Rome, of uh, Christianity, the Western world. Now, where does Rome come from? You have the name Rome. You, any of you remember where it says Rome? So next week's Pasha, check out the Chumash that you'll be reading the Torah next week. Right at the end, it says Magdiel Zu Remi. Magdiel is a grandson of Esau, a minister, a leader. And he's Zu Remi. Magdiel, Rome, comes from the word Reim, means something exalted. And Magdiel is Zu Remi. So name Rome is essentially a child, a grandchild of Esau. So suddenly, again, and I, I, I'm, I, I'm saying it in a diluted way, these teachings that God had offered to, at Sinai to the children of Esau, in some way they started embracing them. Because at the end of the day, as Maimonides makes very clear, that though Christianity is obviously not a religion for Jews, and even for non-Jews there's also questionable elements to it, but uh, the bottom line is, it took a pagan world that was worshipping itself and its idols and turned it into a world that began to embrace higher principles. And frankly, we would not have a country like UK, nor the United States, nor the freedoms were not for the Christians that established these countries. These are not Jewish countries. It took a few thousand years or a few whatever the number would be, I would say 15, 1600 years, for the Christian world to become tamed and create an environment that would have become a haven for the Jewish people, and we cannot ignore that. <clears throat> But as I'll soon be discussing, Christianity had to go through its growing pains. 600 years later, comes a man called Muhammad, and he's roaming in the, the pagan world of the Arab world in the Arabian Peninsula, and what is he teaching them? He went into Jewish synagogues, studied with Jewish scholars, and he's teaching them his version of Moses' prophecies. Again, Not something that is relevant necessarily to us as Jews. We have our Judaism, but it's important to know. So the children of Yishmael suddenly, who were presented the Torah approximately 1,700 years earlier, give or take, are now embracing at least elements of, again, monotheism, which is clearly, as Maimonides rules, Muslim, Islam is mon monotheism, and the principles of virtue, of Tzedakah, Mishpah, the ideas that Abraham espoused back then, when his son Yishmael heard them in the first place. So it's interesting, this is not a coincidence. It's all documented. So here's Abraham teaching these ideas. Yishmael, in some distorted way, is banished from Abraham's home. Esau as well. Jacob continues the tradition, brings it to the Jewish people, they receive the Torah. But the children of, grandchildren and child of Abraham are not going away. They, at the end of the day, Esau carries Abraham's genes, as does um, Yishmael. So they ultimately, the purpose is that they also would need to embrace these principles after time, whether they like it or not. And that's exactly what happened. What happens next in the dots of history, and then we'll go back to Abraham's uh, tent and home. What happens next is Christianity goes through its so-called It's a mild way of putting it, but I'll say growing pains. What is growing pains? It's a very radical religion that feels extremely threatened by Jews, makes it their goal that Jews are Christ killers, and we do anything to obliterate them. I don't know if you're familiar with the book called Constantine's Sword. Well, Constantine was the, was the, emperor, was the, was the, was the leader of, of Rome, the first one to embrace Christianity because his mother was a Christian. Until that point, it was still a minority religion. Once Constantine embraced it, then it became the official religion of the Roman Empire, which essentially meant the official religion of the largest superpower of the time. And they forced people to convert, and that's where Christianity really takes off. Here's an interesting little anecdote, however. The enemies of the Jews, of course, Christianity saw Judaism always as a threat, and for obvious reasons, 
you go to any therapist and they can explain to you about older siblings, so to speak, and uh, the jealousies and so on, because as long as the Jews existed, what do you need a New Testament if there's an Old Testament? They won't acknowledge that. They'll turn it into some other argument. So obviously the Jews were a, a walking witness, living witness. You got to kill the witness. Constantine was brilliant. He said, if we kill all the Jews, we will never have scapegoats to blame. So we keep, have to keep them alive. So that way, no matter what happens, we can always blame the Jews. This is documented. Can you imagine? Now, I am sure God would not have allowed them to kill the Jews anyway. But that was his plan. And that's exactly what happened for the next few centuries. Every time any corruption, a, a pogrom, a blood libel, the Crusades, and so on. Now here's not the place to go into all the details of the Middle Ages, but suffice it to say that we suffered tremendously, Jews, under their hands, more than the Muslims ever did. Not to justify or in any way minimize what's going on now. I mean, the bloodbath, they say there's more blood in the, in the rivers of Europe, Jewish blood, than there is water. You go through one country after the next. France, UK, every country, Spain, had its expulsions, overtaxation, persecutions, murders, banishments, ex uh, the, the, you name it. We had nowhere to go. Europe, I mean, I'm not even going to get to the Holocaust, which many scholars argue is a direct outgrowth of Christianity because there's no way there would have been a climate of 100 million Germans accepting such a thing if there wasn't already anti-Semitic bias, which was at the heart of every, you know, Jews are, Jews are Christ killers, and that's that. It's, it's a knee-jerk reaction for so many, not even necessarily deliberate. It's like cultural at this point. So that's what you had. We had that's what we were dealing with, Christian-dominated society. There were Jews in the Muslim countries. We'll get back to that. But they did not suffer at close to what they suffered under the Christians. As a matter of fact, the Alter Rebbe, Balatanya, writes a very fascinating thing in his book, Lakute Torah. He writes that the reason they are more humorous, why the Ashkenazim have more stringent regulations and guidelines than the Sephardim do in many matters, for example, not eating rice on Pesach and other issues, is because it, there was more persecution under the Western world than there were in the Muslim world. And when there was more persecution, the Jews needed to put more guidelines and more safeguards to maintain their integrity. He writes that clearly. And, that's, and it's a fact. Again, not taking away or minimizing the crimes that we suffered at the hands of... But what happened next? Slowly, slowly, it took time, the Christians ultimately became defanged, if I could put it this way. You know, I don't like to use the word market correction, but it was a real market correction. What happened is, in the 17th century, with the Renaissance, and then in the Enlightenment, emancipation of the Jews. And they relaxed. They began to relax their rules until the point where approximately three, four hundred years ago, they became institutionalized governments that do not allow racism and anti-Semitism. I'm not discussing now individuals that still hate Jews. Of course that we have that. But an institution that will protect Jewish rights, that will give us the freedom of religion, is a relatively new thing. Just three hundred years old, as uh, Chow and Lai said. But it is a great blessing. And it came at the hands of people who persecuted us. I'm not getting into all their intentions where it's all pure, but the bottom line result is we have to be thankful. But we don't forget the history. We understand that Christianity went by the sword. That's what the Crusades said. And what were they all fighting over? Jerusalem. Everybody wants control of Jerusalem. Everybody senses consciously, unconsciously, Jerusalem is the heart. What uh, Yaakov says in this week's chapter, Shara Shamayim, is the gate to heaven. For some reason, everybody senses control Jerusalem and essentially you are God's chosen. And that's what the Christians were fighting for. Okay, so now we have, as far as the Christian world goes mostly, pretty much freedom. But what about what's happening now parallel? Let's talk about, go back to the Muslim world. The Muslim world, which began around 700 years later, so initially it was not as uh, violent. Then there, back and forth there were times they were very, very aggressive. And now in the last 100 years, especially in the last 50 years, suddenly here's what we have. Now it's nothing new. As I said, Yishmael was at war with Isaac. And you hear, every time you hear terrorist attacks, what are they all saying? God is great. Allah Akbar. Right? And then they say, 
that they're fighting what? The crusade Zionist conspiracy. Where are they getting crusade Zionists? The crusades are dead hundreds of years. So here, listen to the next piece of the puzzle. When I was reading the texts that those hijackers back in 9-11, and I'm sure reading now, I wanted to see who are their mentors? Who so-called are their ideologues? Who's teaching them? What ideas are they hearing? Most Western world have no clue. We just know they want to kill us, and we got to protect ourselves. So I went to start looking at the texts, and I discovered this man called Katab. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Q-U-T-B. He's one of the, one of the founders, one of the so-called uh, leaders, teachers of what we call Muslim fundamentalism. He was actually executed by President Nasser in Egypt in 1968. Okay? However, he wrote 60-volume commentary on the Quran. Bin Laden is the direct disciple of his, studied with him, embraced him, and preached his teachings. Okay? Most of you probably never heard of him. And definitely not what he teaches. Let me tell you what he writes. And I had to study it. I had to find Arabic translations. I don't read Arabic. To see what does the guy say. And when you read it, it like opens your eyes to a few things. What does Katab say? He says, basically this. God created the world in order for us to take the world and turn it into a divine home. You familiar with this idea? Okay. So far, so good. And he chose the Jewish people to do so. Abraham and the Jewish people, his descendants, to come and bring God to this world. A world that is a materialistic world, a selfish world, a, a pagan world, that the Jews, starting with Abraham, would bring a new approach of justice, virtue, charity, kindness. Okay, but then the Jews messed it up. They corrupted the system, they became self driven by their own self-interest. So God chose the Christians. That was the next step. And they messed it up even more. They monetized it, and they turned it into their own business. So then finally God said, okay, one more chance, I will choose the Muslims. And that's what he did. The Muslims replaced the Christians, who replaced the Jews, and they are now the chosen people to do what? To bring God to a decadent world. Now, of course, the next step is where he discusses how you do that. And he says you do it by all means. You don't, even if it cares violence, murder, it's not murder, you're killing in the name of God. You're bringing godliness to this world. That night before September 11th, those terrorists that were flying those planes, these were documents that were found in their rooms. These were documents that were found. They did other things that night too. But I don't know how they reconciled the two. But the bottom line, they were reading documents. When you read these documents, you don't hear anything about death, about hijackings, about killings, about blood. You hear about, you know, if you read it, you'd think it's some type of uh, spiritual um, exercise in, uh, in transcendence. You read words like this, that I am dedicating my entire life to bring God to the world. I will not hesitate and be fearful. I will have the courage to do this. Total commitment, that type of tone. That's what they're reading. That's what they're studying. Now, if you think about it, you're a young 17, one is a young 17 or 16 or 15-year-old Muslim. He's grown up that every sermon delivered on Friday by the imams are telling you how bad the West is and that we are the chosen people. And then, in an impressionable moment, looking for a passion for a cause, it's very understandable why you would embrace such a cause. It's not that crazy. And it's not a, we like to call it a culture of death. They're not sitting and embracing death. No, they think this is the way to God, to God's kingdom. You got to mysterious snafish. You got to do what it takes. Now, obviously, I make it very clear, I'm not in any way justifying it. But you have to go into those minds. So you think when they do a beheading, they're like, you know, barbarians, and we can't stand seeing it? No. They see it as they're doing God's service, and we can't let our resistance to blood and to beheadings to get in the way. So what is the response to that, of course, we need to answer. But more importantly, where does this come from? This is what's going on today. So I would submit and say that the Muslim world is basically where the Christian world was in the 18th century or 17th century. They're still in that mode of growing up. I know it sounds a little mild, but basically they do not know how to present their ideas in a way 
that comes with peace in kind ways. They only know violence. Now I want to share with you a Talmudic story, which I want to make sure it does not offend anyone because it's not in any way comparable, but everything on a subtle level begins in our own ideas. There was a man called Rashbi. Rab Shimon Bayechai. He was a great Talmudic giant, a great mystic, the father of Jewish mysticism, you can say, the author of the Zohar. He had to run away and escape from the Romans because they forbade the study of Torah and he, and he hid in a cave for 12 years. And the Talmud tells us all the details. Now obviously a man like him, what did he do for 12 years? He studied, he prayed, he became even more spiritual than he ever was. So after 12 years, you can imagine how refined and how subtle and sensitive he was. Comes out after 12 years, the decree was over, so he was able to come back to civilization. And he gives one look, he sees a world that is consumed with pettiness, materialism, mediocrity, you know, short-term gratification, etc., etc. So the Talmud says, whatever he looked at began to burn whether it means literally or figuratively. Bottom line is, this holy man could not tolerate it and in some ways destroyed everything in his path because he could not deal with that type of um, the decadence, you can say. Antithetical to anything that's godly. So Hashem says to him something very interesting. He says, you know, you're not ready to come out. You have to go back a 13th year, bar mitzvah year, become more spiritually mature. The next time you come out, what happens after the 13th year? Wherever he went, instead of it getting burned up, whatever he saw was broken, he fixed. So you would think that would be somewhat downgrading. Look, a man 12, after 12 years is so pure, everything burns in his path. No, that's not the way. That's not the Jewish way. We did not come to destroy the world. We came to heal the world. You see darkness, bring light. You see something broken, fix it. That takes more restraint, but it takes more maturity, and it takes more spiritual connection. It's easy, relatively speaking, if you're a very powerful force and person, to just give, give, give. It takes a lot more discipline to be restrained, to channel it. Imagine a brilliant teacher just speaking, 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 and he overwhelms his students. A great teacher speaks in a way that he knows able to conceal, or somewhat channel, harness his intelligence, that people can take it and, 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 and they can contain it. So in a subtle way, we Jews have always struggled with this challenge. You know, if you're a mediocre person, if you're a passive person, you usually don't have extremes, so you get along with everybody. But if you have, a, if you have strong personality and you have strong beliefs, you stand up for them. That's why we argue all the time. Because we stand for something. We're not just passive. We don't, like, you know, okay, who really cares? And when you fight for a position, there's always the risk of crossing boundaries and becoming personal and actually being hurtful. As a matter of fact, the students of Rabbi Akiva, great students, 24,000 students, they were colleagues of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. He saw the damage done. They were great scholars. And they heard from Rabbi Akiva that you have to love everyone. And yet, they were so passionate about their positions, they could not agree with each other. So it spilled over, they did not respect each other. As a result, they suffer a great tragedy, a, a, a death, a plague. And that's why on the, in the sphere, in the days of sphere, between Passover and Shavuot, we don't do mu weddings and music and so on because we remember that. We don't just remember it of nice co to commemorate. We remember the dangers of overzealousness. So Jews are very sensitive to this matter. And that has been the problem, firstly, with the Christians and the Muslims. On the contrary, it's a belief, they have beliefs but they don't know how to harness them. It's like children given fire. Now, again, this is not minimizing what they're doing, but it's trying to understand where it's coming from. I don't know if this is real or a joke. They say when Muhammad established Islam, so he went into Jewish synagogues. And they say he went in on Yom Kippur. So he saw the Jews, number one, bowing, number of times. And number two, he saw that they prayed five prayers. So he thought that's what you do every day. So the Muslims bow every day and they say five prayers. I don't know if this is accurate. Is this uh, historically correct? But maybe a good theory. Bottom line is, even prayer, you have to know when to pray and when not to pray. You can't overwhelm the boundaries. 
So essentially, I go back and I say that Islam is approximately where the Christians were probably two or three hundred years ago. The good news is we don't need to wait two or three hundred years, as we shall soon discuss. Um, but there is a, uh, a serious market correction needed as well there. Now let's go back to um, Abraham. So what did Abraham teach? Abraham taught passionate commitment to virtue. And there was a risk. There was a risk. Yishmal, by the way, which means Yishmakel. Yishmakel, that's what it means. That he will listen to God. So some of the commentaries say that he would listen too well. And he became very aggressive in his beliefs. He wasn't defying Abraham's ideas. He was just being intolerant to anyone around him. So it was the exact opposite problem. And that's why he was a problem, because he was misunderstanding and taking Abraham's ideas and becoming aggressive about them. Same thing with Esau. Aggression is what defines Esau. Balance, they were lacking balance. That's exactly what happened. So essentially it was like a, a religion that they couldn't come to terms with, with the world. He was burning up the world, as was Esau. What the Hasidic literature says, that Yishmael was chesed of Abraham taken to the farthest extent. Too much love, which isn't disciplined. And Esau was the opposite, taking gvura and aggression to the farthest extent without the balance that's necessary, the harmony. Look at this. Abraham, what does he do when he faces infidels? I, I don't have many Muslim friends, but a few I do have. And I always ask them this question because it's, it, it's, uh, it's uh, so obvious. When Abraham faced infidels, what did he do? Well, we have a whole chapter about it. Sodom and Gomorrah were two wicked cities, corrupt cities. God first considers not telling Abraham about it, then he does tell Abraham. And what happens next? Abraham says, no, you can't destroy these cities. Maybe there's a righteous person there. Uh, the judge of the entire world will not do justice. And he goes through an entire battle which he confronts God and does not want Saddam to be destroyed. Not because he supported their behavior, but there, maybe there's some hope. So God says, fine, find 50 tzaddikim there, righteous people, and I'll save the city. Can't find 50, not 40, can't find one. So here you have a real story in the Bible. Now one would think Abraham, a man of God, a man who fought his entire life for virtue, sees finally wicked people being punished, you'd think he'd embrace it, right? You know, throughout history, we ask the question, the wicked, why the wicked prosper and the good suffer? You finally have a situation where God is ready to, to pay them back for with their crimes, and Abraham suddenly says, no, hold up. So clearly there's something going on here, because Abraham understood that the way and the path has to be to get them to transform them, not destroy them. Obviously, he wasn't right at the end of the day because they were too cruel. So we ask any Muslim today whether they're, they consider themselves moderate or not. Tell me, you're, you, Abraham is the holiest man in your life? He's the father of, of, of Yishmael? Yes. Why don't, we, why don't you learn from him how to deal with infidels? You call the West infidels. They're decadent. Look, what did Abraham do? I've never found an answer to this question. Now, this is biblical. This is not some type of nice theory. This is what happened. Abraham prayed for Saddam. So it has to tell you that there's a complete distortion in the Muslim system. You know, we don't say that every Muslim is a terrorist, but every terrorist is a Muslim. That's the fact. It's a breeding ground. And I'm the first to say, I will not say that they all want blood, but they are all sympathetic to the cause of Islam controlling the world. Some will say it should be done peacefully, some through democracy, let just outnumber the Westerners in Europe and just take over the country peacefully, which as many say that. And, but there are enough that say you have to do it with a sword. But regardless, why do you think there's a mosque in every holy site, Jewish or Christian, where the Muslims have control? Why are there two mosques on the Temple Mount? They pray with their backs to the Temple. They pray toward Mecca, Medina. So why are there two mosques on the Temple Mount? And in Beersheba? What exactly is uh, about Islam in Beersheba or Shechem? Because for a Muslim, whenever the Ottomans or the Muslim captured a city, for them it's a sign of God's favor that they can build a mosque in a place that was once Jewish. This is fundamental Muslim thinking. 
And they don't even see anything wrong with it. Because remember what Katab says. The Jews are no longer the chosen people. It's the Muslims that are. So God wants the Muslims to bring God to the world. Now the moderate Muslims will tell you, yeah, we actually believe that, but we believe it should be done peacefully, inspirationally, education, but they're not really the dominant forces. And I'm not going to get into the whole princes of Saudi Arabia who use the whole situation for their own uh, um, staying in power, because it's very convenient to have radicals, because then you could say, I'm better than the radicals. That's another discussion. But the point I'm making here is that the battles that you have today all began with individuals. Just multiply your small by a few million and a few billion, and you have what you have today. Multiply the Christians, uh, Esau, by billions, and you have what you had for hundreds of years. But here's this, the thing. At the end of the day, the Christian world has become tamed. You know, I'm not saying that they all love Jews. You know, right now, the Christian right, especially in the United States, are the biggest supporters of Israel, frankly. You know, and some people they ask rabbis, what do you think about that? Because they also say that they support Israel because then the next step will be that Jesus will return and, uh, and the Jews will be massacred. So most rabbis intelligently answer, you know what? Let them support us now. We'll worry about next step when it comes, you know? Because you've got to believe that, of course. So we're not worried about this situation. Let them support. Now, I want to share with you one more, two more, uh, one, one more uh, Zohar. That's very important. There's a Zohar at the end of chapter of Eira, which is in the book of Exodus. So Zohar is a mystical text. It says the following. You can look it up. It's almost, I'll tell you almost word for word. The Zohar says that at the end of days, there will be uh, the, the Sar, the, uh, the ministering, ministering angel of Yishmael, will come to God and say, Yishmael deserves reward. Why? He's a son of Abraham. And... He was circumcised at age 13, but he was circumcised. And we need to give him reward. He deserves reward. You gave the reward to the Jewish people. You gave them the promised land. You gave them other gifts. What does Yishmael get in return for all his work? God considers it, the Zohar says, and says, you're right. We'll give them reward. This is the Zohar. This is a prediction as, as I, I, it's a little prophecy. Because the Zohar is, precedes the Muslim world for sure. <coughs> So God says, I will give them control over Eretz Yisrael, but, what, but because Yishmael circumcised himself when he was 13, which was meaning not Tomim, it wasn't complete, it was somewhat of a compromised circumcision, I will give him control over Israel when it's in a compromised state, when it's a wilderness, not when it's a, uh, a, an empire. And if you count, and I'll give it to him control over four or five, I think 600 years, or 400 years, I'm not sure, I don't remember. And that will be it, and then the reward will be repaid. And that's what happens. Who controlled Israel and Jerusalem until the early 20th century when the British destroyed the Ottoman Empire? It was the Ottomans. And that's when the mosques were built and so on. Exactly what the Zohar predicts. And then the Zohar says that at the end of days, after that, Yishmael, the children of Yishmael, will attack the children of Edom, which is Esau. Basically, the Muslim world will attack the Christian world. And there will, be, uh, there will be casualties on both ends. And the end of it all, Mashiach will come. That's what the Zohar says. You can check it out. I found the Zohar, actually, because I was reading a note. There was a uh, Kabbalist, a very holy Jew. His name was Rabbi Zev Greenglass, who lived in Montreal, Canada. And he was an interesting individual. He wrote a note to the Rebbe, that I don't know, I found somewhere in my files, right after September 11th, a handwritten note, where he writes to the Rebbe that he found a discourse, a Hasidic discourse written in 1880 by the Rebbe Marash, the fourth Chabad Rebbe, that says that Abraham prayed for Yishmael, Lu Yichia Yishmael Lefanov, that I, I pray and I hope that Yishmael will survive me, will, be, will uh, inherit my legacy, and so on. And, he, and then he adds a line, the Rebbe Marash. Even though Abraham knew in prophecy who Yishmael was, what his personality was, a wild man, and he knew, listen to this, what he would do at the end of days, he still prayed for Yishmael. So Rabbi Greenglass asked the Lubavitcher Rebbe, What's, what, what is the, at the end of days? And he suggests the Zohar, the end of the era that I just cited. And the Rebbe adds, and see also the Zohar, the end of Balak, 
chapter Bullock, so there's another Zohar that discusses it. Then the Rebbe adds, and also look at the prayer, the Slichot prayer that we say on the second day of Slichot, which, mind you, is the day before September 11th. So what do we say there? That Seir v'chesnei, which is a, a cryptic way of saying Esau and his father-in-law, Yishmol, will be eliminated. And the Rebbe adds, v'oid, and many more places. When I saw that, they opened my eyes, I say, oh, one second, there's a whole subscript that people in the know seem to know that something's going to happen with Yishmol and Esau at the end of days. But you don't really hear about it. Because obviously, number one, no one wants to frighten anyone. Number two, maybe these things are best to keep quiet. But now when you see it happening, it's a clearly unfolding of all these statements. Now this doesn't mean it's predestined, and it doesn't mean that anyone's off the hook for killing any innocent person. That's very clear. It just means that you're dealing with a hotbed, with a, uh, with a combustion chamber, which is the Muslim world. And the real understanding of this is absolutely a religious war. This is what the Western world refuses to accept. Because as with all the benefits of our freedoms, you have to remember the battle between science and the religion in the age of the Enlightenment has taken its toll. Nobody wants to hear about religion anymore. You know, especially the French Enlightenment, Voltaire and company, they wanted and they predicted that within 200 years there'll be no more religion except for the peasants, what they call the carnet, the, the rubbish of, of society. So most thinkers today and most leaders, they, want, they don't want to hear it's a religious war. They think it was over in 18th century, 19th century. We don't want to hear about religious wars. That's why you hear a very shallow response. Yes, we'll, we'll defend our citizens, we'll kill them where they are, but no one talks ideological because no one wants to discuss an alternative, passionate, um, spiritual approach to this. Israel included. And I'm not here to be critical of Israel, obviously, especially in these times we have to be united. But we cannot deny that if you don't have perspective, historical perspective on something like this, there's no way you can fight this war. Our, our own President Obama, I won't even go there, he doesn't even acknowledge that it's Islam. Forget about the rest. Others will say it's Muslims. But it's no doubt this is a religious battle on their end. And the response from the West is, no, you're a bunch of criminals and we won't let you kill us. That's essentially what you hear. You need to have a spiritual leader. We need a spiritual leader that will get up and say, you've hijacked religion, you've hijacked spirituality. Original Abraham taught all these ideas, but he taught that it has to be done through inspiration, through, through, uh, through uh, education. And frankly, I have to say, I don't think the battle can be won. I mean, God can do it, what he can do, it will do in his part. But from the bottom, from down on earth, the only way we can win this war is the war is going to be fought in the Muslim education system. Because as we speak now, we can kill ISIS and you can kill all the terrorists. But in the schools right now, there's a, they're being bred to believe that Jews come from apes and monkeys. Just read some translations of, of speeches given by Imams Friday in their mosques in Israel. I was in Jerusalem, you know, you hear the speech? And I went online to hear what he said. I, it's, it's hard to imagine that, someone, that Israel would let someone speak that way. Complete incitement. Find the Jew wherever he is behind the stone, that's the Quran, and kill them wherever they are. So, you know, we dismiss it. Ah, oh, you know, they're just a little angry. Let them say what they want to say. But children are being taught this. No one even talking about that. How could you expect any change when the next generation is fed this? Exactly like children were taught the Christians that Jews are Christ killers and they drink the blood of Christians and all the libels and insanity that they say about us. So this is what we're dealing with. Now you could say, what's the point of so we know? Well, clarity is a critical, as I said, intelligence. You have to know who you're dealing with. And the response is very clear. Every one of us as Jews must be well informed. We can't just sit by and say, oh, you know, we don't know what to do. No, we have to teach the world what's going on. And we always know one thing, that actions make a difference. Now you may say, how can we go fight this war? Very simple, exactly as Abraham did. That war of ideas. If each of us is committed with more passion than they are to virtue, to kindness, to unity, to harmony, and not to kill each other and fight with each other, that in a microcosmic way has a ripple effect. They say, how could that change things in the Middle East or in Europe? Well, Jews always knew something that only scientists have, come to, uh, scientists have only come to discover recently. It's called the butterfly effect. A butterfly flaps its wings 
in one part of the world and across the other end of the world, there can be a typhoon. Little things do matter. Maimonides says one act tips the scale. So it's true, those of us that have influence on a more global sense, political and so on, great. But every one of us, in a microcosm, you change your attitude. Instead of Arashbi, after 12 years, attitude where we're intolerant. Even at home, even in our communities, even in our schools. Community with community. You think that when we're divisive and we argue with each other, you think it has no impact? It has absolute impact. We become weaker. If Israel was united, and we wouldn't have Rahman al-Islam, God forbid, the divisiveness and even hatred between Haredim and the secular, no one could touch us. There's no question. I'm sure everybody agrees with that. And the same thing in our own communities. So it's true, it's not necessarily the, the, a dramatic firework solution, but Jews know this. We've always known that when we embrace Abraham's vision with great passion, on a small scale, a microcosm, the microcosm affects the macrocosm. So that's something that each of us can do. Total, absolute commitment to that, a, a, a place that even if you're passionate about something, that does not mean you should any way ever hurt or be disrespectful to another. We can disagree. I have brothers and sisters. I don't agree with everything. We argue about a lot of things. But it's my brothers and sisters. I'll forever love them. I meet people that literally don't talk to their brother and sister, biological brother and sister. Why? Because they're arguing about some uh, inheritance from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, money. And you think money can split siblings from each other? How distorted is that? Now I know, unless you're in the situation, you look at it as crazy. Then when people are in it, they say, you don't know what my brother did to me. That if you knew what he did, you also wouldn't speak to him. You know, that type of attitude. But let's be honest. You're not taking your money to the next world, and you will forever be your brother and sister. Because unfortunately, we, are, we can become very petty, and very uh, provincial, and very narrow-minded, and biased. We all have our prejudices. I'm, I'm, I don't think it's beyond me either. I think we're all capable. But that's not the Torah way. We have to learn to transcend. We learn how to grow. And if we are not going to be the role models and examples, who is going to be? Because at the end of the day, the Christians and Muslims are newcomers on the scene. I mean, relatively. To me, it's like, it's such a tragedy. Israel says, Israel should be right now the role model of what it means to be a virtuous, spiritual, refined. Now, Israel has many qualities. And we have a great army there. And God should bless everyone there and be protected. But what, that's what we should be exporting. You know, startup nation. It shouldn't just be NASDAQ technology companies. It should be principles that would change the world that were taught 3,500 3, years ago by our grandfather and, and uh, ancestor Abraham. That should be the language. I have no doubt if that would be coming out of Israel, it would have changed very much what's going on. Also, of course, the attitudes. Now, I don't find that right now is not a good time, in my opinion, to criticize policies that go on in Israel that started already after the Six-Day War. But those of you familiar know that we brought a lot of problems upon ourselves. That suffices to say that. Again, now is a time of unity. That's not the point. But we control our destiny, Jews. I have no question in my mind. I was in Israel in 1971. I was a boy of 14 years old. And it was the same Arabs and the same Muslims and it was just a few years after the Six Day War. I can tell you, without question, I was there for two months. I went everywhere without fear. I was in the Muslim quarter. I was on Arab buses, Arab taxis. There was nothing. The same people. Where was all the hatred? You know, because they lost a war, and that's that. You lose a war, and that's, what they, that's it. When you start giving a loser the power to think they're a winner, that's where you got problems. So you wonder, how did Israel change? So enough said about that, because I don't want to go into that details. But the, as far as understanding this perspective, the context of it all, this is where we stand. We stand in a situation, there's a confrontation, it's exactly that, a clash of civilizations, as, uh, who wrote that, Hunting, um, uh, Sir uh, Edward, who wrote it, Huntington? Huh? Huntington. Huntington. It is a clash of civilizations, it's a religious war, it, it, uh, the Islamic State doesn't have a problem stating that they want a caliphate, they want to control, others couch it more, it's no question about it. And you can't fight a religious war with weapons. Yes, you need weapons to protect ourselves. And you need to eliminate them. No question. We're all for that. But that doesn't win the war. Because you still have the issue with the ideology. And then you have the next generation. Today it's called ISIS. Tomorrow is something else. The Western world has not woken up. Let's be honest. Not September 11th. 
and not even the recent uh, tragedies in uh, Paris and al Tiftah Peh and hopefully nothing more. It's not woken up. Whatever reason, maybe it's too uncomfortable, maybe people are just in the mode of survival and they're just, you know, I don't know what it is. I'm not looking to suggest that we need more blood till we wake up. You know, God should bless us all, especially as Jews, that we should lead the way in achieving this clarity. If we can communicate it, I think maybe we can wake up some people. Because everybody here in this room has your sphere of influence. You know, you should be able to speak about this with intelligence, with uh, fortitude, with confidence. We don't have to be defensive. What do we, you know, when you start saying, what about these occupied territories, you know, that we're to blame for everything. Why? Because if the Palestinians were not so uh, oppressed, they wouldn't be killing anyone. Yeah, you know something? Six million Jews were killed and our blood boils from it. Did we go blow up one cafe? We were also, uh, and the whole world was silent. Why didn't we blow up cafes? You know why? Because that's not the way of Abraham. You know, our revenge, as any Holocaust survivor will tell you, he opens up a photo album, our revenge, look at my grandchildren. I have 30, 40, 50 grandchildren. That's our revenge. I think I mentioned today in Shul, or where are some of the talks? I have so many talks, I don't know where I mentioned what. But I mentioned I was in Berlin a few years ago, Hanukkah, and I wanted to go to the, where's the Brandenburg, uh, whatever it's called, gate, where Yamach Shemai Hitler, may his name be erased, used to stand and you have pictures and images with his hundreds of thousands of Huguenot legions, you know, so, inciting them. So I wanted to see the area. We go to the area, it's Hanukkah. So the rabbi, Tachtel, Shliach there in Berlin, I go, and he proudly shows me the area. Yeah, exactly where he stood. This man that I mentioned, this demon, is a big menorah, a Hanukkah menorah, instead of him. And I'm looking around, where's the Christmas tree? You know, and, he, and I see it, far and right. So I asked Rabbi Tachtel, how'd you pull that off? You know, there are more Christians in this country than Jews. So he says to me, I convinced the curator that for aesthetic purposes and for pictures, the menorah in the center would really look good, and the tree would be a very good, uh, you know, where it's placed. So he did it there. But I found to be, wow, that's something. And then you see little Jewish children running around with tzitzit, with a kippah, going to cheder, to school there. And you say to yourself, yes, they killed six million of us. We won't, we won't forgive them for that. But their children are hiding their identities. They don't want you to know who their parents and grandparents were. And the, and the corporations there that benefited from the destruction of the Jews are all concealing their pasts. And we're walking proudly and putting up a menorah there. That, to me, is victory. Now, of course, we could have been much more, it would have been a lot more pleasant had we not had to suffer. I once asked Eli Wiesel, he was fr friends with my father. They were both journalists back when. And uh, I said to him, is it true that Jews in the concentration camps would sing Animamin when they went to their deaths? There's a song, Animamin. I believe with complete faith that Messiah will come, even though he tarries. So he said he wasn't in that area because it was a different area. The death uh, area was different where they were in their, bunk in their whatever it was, bunkers. And he said, but I could tell you, every night he heard Shema, he heard Kaddish, and he heard Ani Mamin too. So he has no doubt that it's true. So I asked him, and I've asked this to several Holocaust survivors that I've met. I said, tell me something. It doesn't make any sense. There's no darker time in history where the Jews could have easily said God is no longer with us. It was like the worst possible time with what was going on there. And yet, how crazy is it that Jews are thanking God and praying to God and saying, we believe in Mashiach. As of what? I mean, they were in the worst possible scenario. You know, they say, they'll tell a story about a, a Nazi was about to kill a Jew. And the Jew says, can I say something before you kill me? Yes. And he starts saying vidu, he starts saying a prayer. And the Nazi gets all upset, he says, what are you saying? He says, I'm thanking my God. What are you thanking your God, you miserable Jew? You're about to be killed. He says, I'm thanking God that he didn't create me like you. That's what they tell the story true or not, but it's, I mean, it's tragic, but it, because, and this is the answer that they gave the Holocaust survivors. They said, because we were telling ourselves and the world, you can kill our bodies, but you can't kill our souls. You can take our lives, but you can't take our faith. And if it won't be us, it will be our children. And if it won't be our children, it will be our grandchildren. We will prevail. So the Jews were basically making a statement, yeah, you're not going to kill our souls, 
even if we die. That's why we say those prayers. And that's exactly what happened. Now, we will never know the mystery, and I'm not in any way going and treading in this sacred territory of understanding what happened there. It was one of the biggest complaints we could have to God. But we don't become sufferers even if we suffer. We pick up the pieces and we rebuild our lives. And we've grown and we've become greater. And a renaissance of Jewry in different places, in Berlin, in the former Soviet Union, in Israel. With all our challenges, because at the end of the day, we know what Abraham taught us. You keep fighting for light with more passion than they fight for darkness, you'll prevail. It may not happen in a second. And that's what we have to maintain. So we can't just be bystanders and say, hey, what's going on? That's unacceptable. We Jews have to show a path that is over 35 years, 100 years old. And the world needs to hear it. All people in the world. Obviously, we need to do all the military and police and whatever is necessary to protect innocents and destroy anyone that's willing to kill an innocent person, Jew or non-Jew for that matter. But the bigger picture, the long term, is understanding the map, understanding the map of history, the dots, and there is a pattern, and ultimately this world will have to come to peace with God, which means a harmony between religious passion and coexisting with a modern world, even if you don't agree with it. That's ultimately the challenge. And Jews have mastered the art. We are children of Jacob, not just of Yishmael and Esau, we received the Torah. The world has yet to embrace it completely. So we have a real responsibility here, both in understanding what's going on, studying about it, sharing it with others, and acting on it. As I said before, our macrocosm in our personal level, and which will spill over into our communities, and spills over to our uh, states and countries, and ultimately to the entire world. And as the Zohar promises us, you know, someone who suffered a great tragedy told me once, she signs her emails, this with this line, and I asked her about it. She said, she's over trying she writes, at the end, everything will be good. If it's not good, it means it's not the end. This is a person who suffered, so it wasn't just some type of bumper sticker cliche. We are of absolute belief that this will come to an end, I mean the, the, the negatives, and that we will experience what our forefathers and our ancestors all prayed for, all hoped for, and we have the gift that we can live in freedom we can sit here in a shul, no, not to be afraid of anyone informing on us, arresting us. We have our challenges, but today the challenges are internal. Yes, we have the enemies we need to deal with, but the biggest challenge is our own internal apathy. You know, they asked a guy, what's worse, apathy or ignorance? And he said, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> Never be apathetic. It's better to have someone you argue with and disagree with adamantly than apathy. It's the kiss of death. You know, you share with someone a life-shattering, experience and they say they yawn and they fall asleep they say what do you think oh, you know that's much worse at least argue with me at least disagree with me it's a sign of life apathy is not a healthy attitude and as i've said a number of times something i always heard from my father as a journalist there's three types of people people who make things happen people who watch things happen and people who ask what happened we jews always made things happen always we were always the headlines from abraham till today and that's what we have to assume that posture again. Cannot just be bystanders, conformists. We are the pioneers. We come from the pioneers who radically re and, and rebelliously challenged the status quo of this materialistic world and brought ideas that changed the, the universe. Thomas Kael, in his classic book, The Gift of the Jews, writes that there are 30 concepts and words that would not exist were not the Jews. You know what kind of words? Hope, confidence, destiny, Redemption, forgiveness, I don't even remember the rest of them. There's another book called On Two Wings, which I also recommend you read, where a guy, Michael Novak, both non-Jewish writers, says that the entire democratic free world is based on Torah metaphysics, not on Christian ideas, not on Muslim ideas. So we have nothing to be ashamed of. We brought civilization to the world, and now is the time to reclaim that, that legacy in an aggressive way, just like Sinai changed the world, time to return to Sinai and teach the children of Yishmael, the children of Esau, what God wants of us. The right harmony between faith and modernity. The harmony between faith and reason, between science and, uh, and religion, between God and our physical universe. So God should bless, first of all, all the people, uh, brothers and sisters in Israel that protect them in every possible way from any of these attacks. 
and there should no longer be any of that. We should have only Shalom and Eretz Yisrael. But as we also know, we pray for peace in the entire world. Every innocent person is a tragedy, including in France, in Mali, or wherever it may be. And if we do our part, I have no question in my mind that God will be able to do his part. And finally, as the Zohar predicts, and all the prophecies state, that we will come to a point where the children of Yishmael and the children of Esau will live in peace, as the Rashi says in next week's chapter, with the children of Jacob. Thank you very much. Everyone have a Shavuot Tov, and we should only experience brachas and simchas in a revealed way. Thank you.